Hello Grade 12s and welcome to Life Science and today we're going to have a look at revision of evolution right so here we go revision of evolution now what I've done is to, to get to this revision of evolution I thought the best way to actually do this is to just throw you into the deep end right we've gone through evolution quite a few times before and we had a look at at how the bones are structured and how evolution came and we had a look at darwin's theories and and um we had a look at what's what those things um, um natural selection and all of that type of thing right so i thought instead of doing that we're just going to do questions all day all the time we are just going to do questions so let's see how you guys do with the questions that i've given for you well given to you let's have a look at the first one here we go the, ex the um, extract and the diagram below provides information about the type of antelope called a bongo. Right, the bongo is a large antelope species that is active at night. So it's at night, so you know that. Okay, and found in the dense jungle. So remember, dense jungle of the forest in Africa. The dense forests have very little ground vegetation. So... The bongo feeds in the forest openings, right? So it's got to be in the openings where new herbs and shrubs grow close to the ground. Remember, it's got to eat off the ground. So where it's open, where photosynthesis can take place or where there's light coming through, it's going to eat there. The problem is they are preyed on by lions and leopards because they're out in the open now. Okay, so that was just a little bit of background information on the bongo. Okay, so now what I've got for you. There we go. There's your bongo. Have a good look at it. Okay, let's have a look what we have here. First of all, it's light brown coat, has a light brown coat, and a mane with white stripes. Okay, the horns that can be laid flat, can be laid flat along the back while running through dense vegetation. Okay, it has a black and white marking on the face, chest, and legs. It is dark brown belly. <coughs> Short brown tail with black tip. Okay, so that is kind about what it looks like. It, it looks like quite a cool antelope, eh? I couldn't get a, a good picture of it where it's got labels on it, so I left that one for you. So let's have a look at the question that I've got for you. Okay, yeah. State two characteristics that help bongos to camouflage themselves in the dense jungle. Now, before you answer that, you're saying to me, but... What has this got to do with evolution? What has this got to do with evolution? Do me a favor. Answer this question. And once the question's answered to the best of your ability, then we'll go through it. What's this got to do with evolution? So this is going to be a quick, very quick question, right? So I'm going to give you one minute to do it. And give me everything you got. Are you ready? Off you go. Okay, so let's have a look at the answer. There it is again, beautiful antelope, right? And here we go. First of all, the coat is light brown on the upper side and dark brown on the belly, okay? White stripes on the back and the mane, black and white patches on the rest of the body. The tip of the tail is black. And the question was, state two characteristics that help the bongo camouflage themselves in dense jungle. The minute you start breaking up, the minute you start breaking up the coat, that becomes difficult to see, right? So when predators see this, and all of a sudden there's different spots, and it's going to camouflage itself into the back, 
Okay, now, what has this got to do with evolution? Well, think about it. The people that weren't camouflaged as much died out. The ones that were camouflaged, they became strong, right? And they kept breeding. So that is why nature selected them to live on. And that's why we say this has got to do with evolution. They have survived because of evolving this specific coat to suit their environment. Cool, hey? Okay, now I've got some more. Let's get going. I'm gonna do this all the time. So let's see. Use your knowledge of nat natural tourist selection to explain how the bongo's ability to lay, look at this, to lay horns along the back, uh, along its back, could have developed over the years. Here we go again. Explain how natural selection will allow, or, or the ability of the bongo to uh, its horns to lie back on its back or lay back on its back will allow it to develop over the years. And I'm going to give you a minute again, okay? Because this, this is quite quick. So let's see if you're going to come. The others are going to get more difficult. These are quite quick. Another minute. Are you ready? Off you go. Okay, now I explained to you what nat natural selection was just before this question, just to give you a taste of what we're looking at. So let's see how we can do this. Now I've given a nice big explanation. Okay, so let's have a look. There is a variation amongst the bongo pop population. Okay, some of the horns that have uh, can be laid on their backs, while others do not have the horns that can be laid on their backs. Let's just say they started off with that. Some laid down, some couldn't. Okay, then the antelope must move through the dense vegetation without their horns getting entangled in the vegetation. Okay, reason for that is you get chased by a lion, where are you gonna go? Straight into the bushes. Okay, it's its protection. So as it's running straight into the in, into the um, into the jungle, what happens? The ones that horns cannot lay down on its back become entangled, and of course they either die because they can't get loose or the, 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 the lions and they catch them, the lions and the leopard. The ones, those that the horns can lay down on their back, do not become entangled and escape predators and survive. There we go. Nature decides who carries on breeding. It doesn't matter how big, how strong, how developed that animal is, okay? If nature decides the horns must lay down on its back, and the biggest and strongest and toughest can't, it's not going to breed, okay? Not because it doesn't, it do, no, none of them want him. It's because he's going to die quickly. Maybe he doesn't, but there's a big chance he will, okay? So that's what we're starting to look at. Natural selection, very important. Okay, here we go. The characteristics of organisms can be changed through selective breeding and the genetic engineering process. Okay, so here we go. State two similarities between selective breeding process and the genetic engineering process. That's the first question. The next question I have for you is explain two reasons why some people may be against using genetic engineering. I'm going to give you three minutes to do this. Concentrate, give me as much information as possible. Are you ready? Off you go.
Okay, so let's have a look at these, these answers that I have for you. First of all, characteristics that are desirable, okay, or beneficial to the humans are being selected. That's what it means by being um, selective breeding or genetically engineered process. It's what we want as humans, what makes us good, okay, or what makes us feel like it's going to help us. So it's what is beneficial to human beings <clears throat> and what we select, okay. So the characteristics are chosen by humans. It is not artificially, uh, it, it is it is an artificial process, okay? It is not necessarily beneficial to the organism, okay? So, for example, um, if something doesn't work in nature, but we as humans love the color of it, we'll breed the color as long as we look after it. So, we like the color, it will work for us. In nature, it won't, it'll die out. That's artificial, Okay, and the next question that we had here, okay, was explain two reasons why some people may be against using of genetic engineering. Simple, here we go. Long-term effects on health are unknown, which could lead to health problems in the future. Okay, you don't know what's happening. Okay, nature selects it for a reason. Nature really doesn't go and say, we're going to go with this one. Okay, it's what happens with the strongest one, the best suited for that place works. Okay, we don't have a look what's suited, so we do what we can do. Okay, now we don't know if those are going to become a bad thing. We don't care. Next one, long-term effects on the environment are unknown, leading to the environmental damage or loss of biodiversity, damaging ecosystems or damaging nature. Same thing, we don't know if it's going to be disease, we don't know if it's going to da uh, damage nature. Remember, there's two reasons, I'm giving you more than two. Next one, people are morally uh, opposed as humans are in uh, um, interfering with nature, playing God, interfering with the rights of every species. So what we're doing is we say who lives, who dies, who may mate, who can't. Okay, very simple, that's how it works. You have, might have an animal that looks absolutely gorgeous, but it is a runt. In other words, it's not the strong breed. So instead of making the strong breeds breed, what do we do? We take the runt of the litter and we put it with another runt of the litter. Now the runts are breeding and not the strong. It's not a good thing. Okay. And then lastly, um, initially it is an expensive process as many people or countries may not be able to. To afford it. So let's say, for example, we want to look at, um, for example, making maize meals, making sure that maize can withstand drought, okay? Because at the moment, drought water is very, very important, right? So let's say we're losing all our maize meals because of water, okay? So what we do is we make it drought resistant, like very, very highly drought, drought resistant. To be able to do that, to genetically engineer that or fix that, it's going to cost a lot of money. And it costs a lot of money. So what do we do? We might have to go and borrow from other places, and now we're in debt. Okay? So there's a lot of moral things to have a look at and things that could be a problem. Right. Okay. So there was a couple of questions. I think you need a break because you've been working hard. I definitely do, and I'll see you straight afterwards. Cheers. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your break. Now we've gone away from, from these animals that are living there, right? Now we're going to have a look at you and me. Have a look at this question that I've got for you. Yeah, simple. The diagram below represents a possible evolution of humans, okay? It's a possible. doesn't mean that it is. We, we try and get it as close to it as possible, but it's a possibility. As well as the time period for the development of bipedal or should I say bipedalism, the use of fire and the use of tools. Okay, so it's how human developed, how bipedal happened, the use of fire and the use of tools. Okay, so this is all that it is, how it all works. Okay, now, very, very simple, very easy to understand. If we have a look, bipedal, that's bipedal. It started over here. Okay, using of tools started here and using a fire started here, 
Okay, you'll notice that um, a nemesis started there, Afarensa started there, Africanus started there, Erectus, and it's moving along as it goes. You'll notice that they overlap as well. Have you noticed that? Okay, very important to overlap it. Now, watch this. The black pre-humans, okay, this lines is humans. It doesn't mean that, well, it does mean Homo erectus, you'll notice, okay, is humans, and of course you've got Neanderthals as seen as, as uh, humans, and then you get Homo sapiens, which is what we are now, okay. Those are your human ancestors that we're looking at, okay, so it's very, very simple. Now, that is what we're going to ask our questions on. Let's have a look at the first question. Hopefully I can bring it. How many questions do I have? One there. Make sure that it fits on the page. How cool is that? Okay. Use the diagram above and identify two bipedal organisms that did not use stones, tools, or fire. Two bipedals that did not use stone, tools, or fire. Okay. One minute, and I want you to give me an answer. Uh, give me a reason why you say that. Are you ready? Off you go. Let's have a look what it came up with, okay? First of all, the two bipedals, okay? Two bipedals that we're having a look at. It's very simple. Simp uh, simple. It's the anamen anamensis. I'm trying to get it. Anamensis. There we go. And the afarensis. Anamensis and afarensis. There they are. And if you have a look at it, they only started using tools 300 million years ago, or should I say 3 million years ago. Remember, that's the present, the moment, that's 5 million years ago. They only started using tools, and those ones came before that specific part. Right, okay, now, next question that I can give you guys. Here it is. I'm going to, oh, hopefully, let's see. How long... After, how long after developing the ability to walk and on two feet did pre-humans develop the ability to use stone tools? And here we go, show all working out. Very important, show all working out. You need to say after developing the ability to walk, okay, on two feet. So when it becomes bipedal. Pre-humans developed the ability to use stone tools to and show all working out. So I'm going to do that. Okay. And you'll see stone tools. I'm going to be at three, and I'm sure you can carry on from there. I'm going to give you, yeah, two minutes. Let's see if we can come up with the answer. Two minutes. Are you ready? Off you go.
Let's have a look at your answers. This is a very, very easy question to answer. Okay, if you have a look at it, we started off at five, a 4.5 million years ago. Okay, so my equation looks like this. Let me change it. What's name? Okay, so three million years ago, there it is. Okay, three million years ago is when we started using stone tools. Can you see it? Three million years ago. Okay, 4.5 million years ago. Let's see, 4.5 million years ago, here we go, if we bring it up here, is when we started walking, okay? That's when we started walking. That's why we have an uh, anamnesis. There we go, I'm not going to get it right. Okay, so what you have to do, they asked you, what is the difference between the two? So it's very simple, okay? You take 4.5 million years ago, where you started, you minus 3 million years ago, and you get to 1.5 million years years okay so that tells you okay it was 1.5 million years before we uh, when when and when pre-humans started walking to when they started using tools to actually do some work right so for 1.5 million years no stool to uh, as um no stone tools were used can you understand Okay, that was a very, very simple one. And I'm sure you got that. I'm telling you, you guys are brainiacs. We know how this works. Next question. Still the same one. So you've seen that quite a few times now. Okay, explain the significance of the characteristics of the skull which allows for the development of the ability to use tools in homeo, uh, homo, uh, homo sapiens. So listen again. Explain the significance of the characteristics of the skull, which allows for the development of the ability to use tools for homo, uh, homo species, homo species. Okay, and I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you two minutes to do this. Okay, I want you to give me a lot to try and think about exactly what I'm saying. Okay, L read the question again, analyze it, and then put down onto paper what you think the answer is. Are you ready? Remember, two minutes. Are you ready? Off you go. Okay, let's have a look at this. When it came to the question, the question had nothing to do with this picture. Okay, it does, but it does indirectly, but not literally. You're not going to find the answer on the picture as we did the others. Okay, they wanted to know, explain the significance 
of the characteristic of the skull which allows for the development of the ability to use tools of homo species. So in other words, how did you start using tools, or should I go all the way down, in that area? Okay, that's what they're asking you. And let's see what I came up with. Very simple. The cranium increased in size. Okay, so the cranium increased in size. We got the head to become bigger. And not only the head, okay, you will notice that a lot of the primates, it comes like this. Okay, a lot of the primates have changed to start looking like that. Okay, we're looking at that part. And there we go. So, could accommodate a large brain. The bigger the cranium becomes, the larger the brain. The larger the brain, the more we start using tools. Okay, so that was the reason. Okay, and if we have a look at it, humans start using tools, or we start using tools, starts developing bigger brains. And it takes a while to actually get there. Okay, now, still the same one. Let's have a look what I have here for you. Okay, explain the relationship, explain the relationship between the use of fire and the change in the uh, um, dentition in Homo sapiens. We all know what dentition is, okay? These, these babies here, these, these, these things here, right? You've got two minutes to do this for me, okay? Explain the relationship of fire and dentition, the change in dentition. Two minutes. Are you ready? Off you go. Let's have a look at this. Now you'll notice that I've given quite an answer here. It's very simple. What happens is we get smaller teeth. Very simple. And the reason why we get smaller teeth, especially canines in um, homo, homo species. Okay, homo species, your homo sapiens, homo erectus, your homo uh, uh, neanderthals, all of those guys, okay? They can chew food that was cooked which is made softer using fire. Therefore, you don't need big teeth, okay? Or large teeth or canines are not necessary because food is softer because of cooking it with fire, okay? So we do use the size of the teeth. The size of the teeth has got to do with how tough the food is, okay? You try and grab an impala that is lying down there on the ground and you've just got hold of it. Try pull that meat off. Uh -huh, but it's not easy, right? We cook our meat, that's why we make it softer. I mean, we struggle to eat brine meat at times when we say it's, say it's too tough. Can you imagine if it was raw? Right. 
Okay, all these questions, I'm sure you need a break because I definitely do. And I'll see you straight afterwards. Cheers. Welcome back. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at some experiment that, some, that a couple of kids did. Okay, now they can put this in there. Have a look at this, grade 12 questions. Okay, it says, an investigation was done by grade 12 learners, okay, to determine which chicken grows faster, okay? Chickens that are selected breeding for laying eggs or chickens that were selected breeding for meat or poultry or to make food, okay? So we eat them, okay? The following things were done. The following steps were carried out. First of all, learners bought 30 one-day-old chickens from a commercial supplier, okay? 15 of the chickens had been selected breeding for laying eggs, and 15 chickens were have been selected for breeding for meat production. Okay, nice and easy, simple, 15, 15, same day, everything. Okay, all chickens were kept under the same environmental conditions, okay? This include being fed at same chicken feed made mostly from cereal grain and protein sources, so exactly the same food, okay? The chickens were weighed regularly for a period of 45 days. So we know we got them for 45 days. They were, everything was done identical. The only difference is these ones were made for laying, these ones were made for food, everything else, the food, the conditions they stayed in. If they wiped each beak off of the, the egg-laying chicks, they wiped the beak off of each meat one. Right, so everything else was identical. Okay, let's have a look. This is the results. These are the graph. The results came out. Okay, and we've noticed day one, day eight, day 20, day 45. Okay, now, you will notice it said that chicken uh, um, selectively breeding for meat was uh, see-through, and the one with dark is the one for egg laying. Okay, now, first question. Here we go. Calculate the percentage weight increased of the chicken that were selective breeding for meat between day 8 and 45. Show all working out. Okay, I'm going to give you a minute on this one. But I want you to read that question carefully. It's a little bit of a tricky. Are you ready? Off you go. Let's have a look how you did. Now, there are tricks to this, okay? So let's have a look. First of all, okay, first of all, it asks for, I'm going to bring this a little bit down so I can just show you this. There we go. It asks for, look at this, percentage, okay? And it also asks from day eight, not from the beginning. So this is what we're looking for, okay? You need to take 2,500 and you need to make lose 500. On day eight, they were already at a mass of 500 grams, okay? Which means they've only gained 2,000 grams, okay? So we know that it is 2,000 grams, 2,000 grams, right? And you've got to divide the 2,000 grams by the original amount we started with, okay? Which, of course, is 500. Oh, that's terrible. 500 grams, Okay, of course, to get a percentage, you times by 100, okay, and of course, there we go, we know that's the wrong answer because my maths is terrible, okay, the answer is 400%, because 
2,000 divided by 500 is 4, okay? And you times that by 100 gives you 400%. It increased from day 8 to day uh, 45, 400%. That is huge, okay? You need to know, make sure you do the calculations. And there we go. It shows you even we make mistakes, okay? Always make sure you check and you do not rush it, okay? Now, some more questions for you. State one advantage of repeating the investigation with 100 chickens. That's quick, okay? Next one, state three factors that the learners should have, uh, should keep constant in the investigation. Three factors. You guys can do this with your eyes closed. One minute, and I'm going to give it to you. Make sure you concentrate. Give me everything. Work quickly. Off you go. Okay, when it comes to this, a quick thing, okay, when we're looking at this investigation, with a hundred, why would you use 100 chickens? It will increase the reliability, okay? Increasing reliability is huge. The more times you do this experiment, or the more chickens you add to this, the more accurate the results will become. Remember, very important, more specimen to try, the more accurate your results are going to be, right? Now, we were having a look, I asked for three factors the learners should keep constant in this investigation. Now, of course, there's more than three, as you can see that I've put down here. There's a lot more than three. Let's have a look at them. Firstly, same person must weigh the chicken to get the accurate results. Do you know why that is? Okay, because if we're having a look at a scale, we can say, ah, oh, everyone is just on that line. So that line either counts as it or it doesn't. So everybody is identical. Same person weighs it. Here we go. The same scale must be used to weigh the chickens because even though this scale and that scale is made at the same factory, there's a slight difference. Even if it's milligram, it's there. It's a slight difference. Next one. The chick must be weighed at the same time of day. Okay. So if it's going to be at noon at five o'clock, it must be weighed at noon at five o'clock all the time. Main reason, if it hasn't digested its food properly, let's say hot post four, it hasn't gone through that whole process to break down all the food, right? Here we go. Same environmental conditions, which we said. Same food conditions. Same amount of food. That's another big thing. Same feeding time all the time, the exact same time, okay? What happens if you feed a little bit later? What happens if you feed a little bit earlier? If you feed earlier, the... Um, Metabolism kicks in quicker, burns it quickly. You see, there's lots to do, okay? Cage must be the same size. If the cages are slightly bigger in the one and slightly smaller than the other, the one can run around a bit more. See, you can look at that. Chicks must be female. Why must they all be female? Come on. Now, you're going to say, oh, why not male? Come on, why not male? Have you ever seen a male lay an egg? No. Okay, so it's not going to happen. So if you've got egg-laying uh, chicks and you've got meat chicks, they all have to be female. Come on. Okay, don't, don't. we're not looking at male and female, yeah? It's very simple. Males don't lay eggs. <laughs> okay, next one. Age of the chickens, got to be the same. And the same number of chicks in each sample group. If I have a thousand ones to lay eggs, I need a thousand one for meat. Simple, okay? Everything must be the same. Okay, let's have a look. Next one. State two benefits 
of selective breeding for chickens other than the increasing meat production, that's the first one, and explain one reason why selective breeding of chickens for better meat production may not be an advantage for chickens if they were to be living in the wild. Okay, two minutes to do that. Concentrate and think out of the box. Are you ready? Off you go. Okay, let's have a look at these things. First of all, okay, state two benefits of, uh, of selective breeding for chickens other than increasing meat production. Okay, products produced more quickly. Okay, so we have more of them. Next one, increased resistance to diseases. Very big. Improved quality of the chicken. Okay, next one, improved yield of the chicken's product. So in other words, there's so much more than just the size, quality, taste, um, how, quick it, how, how, how quick we can send them out. Okay, so there's the big things. Okay, now all of those are very important. But now, what about explaining why one reason, just one reason, it's, uh, why breeding chickens for better meat production may not be an advantage if the chickens were living in the wild. So chickens that are roaming around free, why is it not good? Let's have a look. Chickens are larger, behavior cannot be, uh, they could not escape from the predators. So they'll be killed, they'll be eaten up. Chickens are larger, they will be unable to move away from predators. Look at this carefully, all predators. Next one, decrease uh, variation, therefore more susceptible to diseases. Okay, they're not gonna be able to change all the time because we're trying to keep them as close as possible. Right, now, I've got a nice question here. If we have a look at these skulls, these are just diagrams of different skulls. Okay, can you label, I'm just going to give you this last one. Can you label X and the type of teeth at Y? So, have a look at this. Can you label X and the type of teeth at Y? And I'm not, I'm going to give it to you, so you don't have to stress. I'm going to change that. These are, these are three different skulls, okay? First one. Okay, it has got, this one is quad, quadrupedal, both B and C are bipedal, okay, both are bi, bipedal, and um, very important to know what they're doing with each one, okay. First of all, why are those big sharp things that um, pierce animals, right, that they use? They are called, or well, they tear, they are called your canines, okay, so Y is your canine, there it is, and X is your fora magnum, okay? 
X is your foreign magnum, Y is your canine, and the foreign magnum is the one where your, your, um, your spinal cord goes up into your skull and holds your brain up. Right, those are the couple of questions. Now, guys, these are very important questions that you've got to go have a look at when it comes to human evolution. Have a good look at them. Very important. Go to past papers. Those are going to help you quite a bit. Okay, I've given you a lot of information, and I know you've worked very, very hard. So it was good to see you guys again. And until next time, I will see you. Cheers. Sia Bangena. Wars and Matrix is back and better than ever. With catch up lessons, revision, and learning support on more platforms than ever before. They are great support materials on the DBE Cloud. Find us on television and revise 10 subjects. And if you miss something, relax and do Go to our YouTube channel or DSTV Catch Up. Need help? Check out Vele, our Telegram based chat platform where teachers are waiting to help you. Prefer WhatsApp? Send questions or voice notes to our Wars and Matrix WhatsApp line. And that's not all. Want to test yourself? Check out the Matric Live app. Hey Matrix 2021, we've got you covered. Confused where to go? Visit the Wars and Matrix website at warsandmatrix.co.za. Wars are Matrix. Hey South Africa, September means it's time for Sia Villa's annual 1 million maths competition where you can practice maths and science questions online with great prices for both learners and teachers. It's a chance for you to learn and win. To enter, sign up at siavula.com and opt in to 1 million maths. Good results in maths and science can open the door to a brighter future. So sign up to Siavula today and join the competition.